Abu Bakr, Uthman and all as well. No, Musa bin Umar. But I also say um, Salman al Farsi. Fascinating. Uh-huh. Yeah, a really interesting story. Yeah. All right. So, about the messengers. So, we've also raised them up at levels, or by levels in degrees, darajat. Wa atayna Isa ibn Maryam al bayinat wa aydina wa ayyad wa ayyadnahu bi ruh al qudus and we supported him Isa and we gave Isa uh, son of Mary clear proofs and we supported him with ruh al qudus do we talk about this mm-hmm. Who is ruh al qudus so so the translation of holy spirit you know raises a whole bunch of problems uh, so one of my teachers translates it as sanctified soul, um, and the common understanding is this is Jibreel Islam. If Allah willed, the other generations would not have fought each other after clear proofs had come to them. But they differed, and some of them believed, and some of them rejected. And if Allah willed, they would not have fought each other. Allah does what He wills. So what's the lesson here? The way history has played out, for good or bad, this is the perfect uh, setup for Ashura. The way history played out, it was in Allah's will for that to happen. Ashura is very, very fascinating, because... So, the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to fast in Mecca, continuing the tradition of the Quraysh. Right, so they used to fast on Ashura for whatever reason. Okay. Um, no communication? Okay. I just saw it. <laughs> so the Prophet in continuing the, the tradition of the Quraysh, he used to fast on Ashura and he used to instruct the Sahaba to do so also. Migrates to Medina and then he receives the ayat about fasting in Ramadan, so he stops telling his followers to fast in Ashura. Because now we're fasting in Ramadan. The, the fast of the three days a month and Mondays and Thursdays seems like that was still in place as Nafal or what we would call Nafal. Then, as you know, he, he found that the Jews of Medina were fasting on Ashura and he's asking them, Why are you fasting? And they said, We are celebrating the day that Allah saved Musa and his people from Fir'aun. So it's the day of the splitting of the sea. And so he says, My people have more right over Musa than you do. So we're going to fast two days. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Hey, what is today? No, no, he, he, no, he, he was, he was telling me about this too. He, he was no, talking, no, you talked about this today. Yeah, in assembly. Some, some assembly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought you did. I was like, this yeah. sounds, I feel like I just said all this <laughs> very recently. You can say it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then it became practice uh, as a nuffle to fast two days, the day of Ashura and the day before and the day after. Then, <laughs> 30 years later, okay, so, so stopping there, so then looking at Judaism for what I could find, if there's anything akin to this, so this is Passover, okay, Pesach, which happens in the spring, okay, in Passover they're celebrating the, the, the exodus and the liberation of the Jews, okay, of the Pharaoh, okay, which culminates in the splitting of the sea. Okay. Why are they so bad? Sorry? Why are the two days... So, there are two different calendars, and so that's one issue, that uh, the Jewish calendar, to stay in line with the solar calendar, you know, January, February, March, they have something that we call intercalation of months, that they'll in, uh, insert a month to keep the calendars lined up, uh, whereas we don't do that. They have a lunar calendar, but they'll insert a month to keep the calendars more or less lined up. And a leap month. Yeah, it's almost like, it's like a leap month, basically. Whereas we don't do that, so then over the years, it just moves to every part of the year, right? So Ramadan could be summer, winter, etc. So that's one point. So Passover, there is a fast in Passover that the firstborns in each family does. I don't know if they still do it. Um, and this is commemorating the time that, Mos- that the Pharaoh, peace be upon him, was told uh, of a prophecy that, you know, someone being born is going to wipe, is going to overthrow you, so that he slaughtered all of them. So the firstborns now fast and we're the survivors. That's one point. Another point is that Jews do fast 
contemporary Jews do fast at the beginning of their calendar year. So they have Rosh Hashanah, Ra'as Hashanah, the first day of the year. And then you have Yom Kippur, which I don't think is the 10th, it's like the 9th or something. Uh, they do fast there, and for them, it's atonement for the year's sins, which is what we're told about for the fast of Ashura. So I think it's fascinating that these are two different things. Um, Yom Kippur for them is what Leil Chokadar is for us. That's the day that God reveals his own decree. Okay. But going back to Ashura and Passover, so Allah is saving them. But then what else also happens in Passover? It's in Passover that in Christianity, Jesus enters Jerusalem. He gets betrayed by Judas, and so handed off to the, the Jewish high council called the Sanhedrin. And they basically charge him with blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And then they hand him over to the Roman governor, who then has a uh, Pontius Pilate, who has him prosecuted for trying to overthrow the government. So Passover that day is a celebration day for Jews, and it's a mourning day for Christians, because that's the day he gets crucified. Good Friday. Easter is where he rises up. Okay. Now go back to our story. 60 years or so after the death of the prophet, peace be upon him, Yazid is the ruler of, of the Ummah, son of Muawiyah, who is the son of Abu Sufyan and Hind. Okay. And so people in Kufa in Iraq are sending letters to, to uh, Imam Hussein, Malik Hussein, the grandson of the prophet, peace be upon him. Um, you, you need to lead a revolt. And he keeps refusing, keeps refusing to find the Hebrews to do so. And so he's headed up to, to Kufa to lead them. And then Yazid's forces find out, and they start heading to, to stop him off. And the people of Kufa hear about this, and they abandon him. And Yazid's forces arrive, surround this camp, and they slaughter everybody except for, uh, like, the uh, um, Imam Hussein's sister Zainab. So that happens on Ashura. So that is the most mourned day of the calendar, which is the same day as the most celebrated day of the calendar. So for Shias, Yazid is basically the pharaoh of this generation. For Sunnis, you find a whole spectrum of readings. One is that because of other things he was involved with, like the liberation of Constantinople, that um, we temper our criticism of him. Others say he was inept as a leader, and others do say he was malicious and wicked. There is a reading uh, in, in, in the history that Yazid intentionally had him killed on his religious make a point. That's one of his best. But the point is that, so you have four traditions. Judaism, Christianity, Sunni Islam, Shia Islam. And what's common, uh, and so there's three events, the splitting of the sea, the crucifixion of Jesus, martyrdom of Imam Hussein. What's common among all three of these? Aside from all happening on the same calendar day. Sorry? The debt is happening. So essentially what's taking place is is some type of uh, attempts or stoppage of tyranny. Because the Pharaoh was the tyrant, and Allah's intervention stopped him. Okay. And then, in the case of Jesus, he's being he's convicted for trying to overthrow the tyrannical government, and then he gets crucified again in Christianity, not Islam. And then, and then in Islam, uh, Imam Hussein is is leading a revolt against against Yazid. Because of either his inept or tyrannical rule, depending on how you look at it. I think it's fascinating, it's all the same day. So, yes, ma'am? Um, maybe you answered this and I just missed it, but so you said Passover for the Jews was the same day as the crucifixion of Jesus, is that correct? Yes. But then if Passover is now, how does. But if Passover is not now, it would be now in our calendar. But for them, it's in. So it's yeah, it's like oh, okay. you always see like Passover and Easter taking place at the same time. Okay. On the calendar, yeah. Okay, okay. They would go with the regular. Gregorian. So they use their own calendar. So this is like the year five thousand seven hundred something something. Right. Uh, but they also adjust their months so the calendars remain lined up. So like Hanukkah will always be like the first week or the second week or the third week. It depends on how they uh, they line up. But for the most part, they line up. So the beginning of their year always happens around the end of September, beginning of October. Rosh Hashanah usually happens around that time. Yom Kippur, usually the beginning of October. That's the beginning of their year. Right? But always, even though they're a lunar calendar, it, it remains lined up with our solar calendar because they insert months to make sure it remains lined up. Yeah. For us, it is haram. Like it's literally haram to, to add months. Where is it?
Yeah. Is it? Uh, it's not in this suit. I'm gonna figure out where. Is it okay? I guess you know, and it's sort of like you kind of have to address the events without making it a person. In other words, the the event of be it this the 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 event arising of the Sunni and Shia, yeah. yes, the uh, ideas or the. And then the schools of thought, what do we want, you know, the yeah. sex, if you want to call it for lack of a better term, or the, you know, the events that happen, you know, the, the battle of the camel, you know, in other words, you sit there and you wonder sometimes, you see Vietnam veterans bonding, how could the veterans of Bother have been involved in something like this, it's very, it's, I, you know, again, it's one of those things you kind of have to reconcile yourself with when you're thinking about it, yeah. and the reconciliation I came up, I sort of come up with personally is, it's just a caution to all of us that if it can happen to them, it can That's happen to it can happen to any of us. That is totally true. Yeah. But it all, but if you take that, then you also have to sit there and analyze what mistakes were made. Yeah. And without making it personal, you do actually have to come to a conclusion about, you know, for example, you do have to come up with a conclusion on Malawi. You do have to come up with a conclusion on, or the actions of Malawi, or the actions of Yazid, or the actions of. In these, fig in these figures in history, you can't just ignore, you know, in other words, there's sort of this thing that's said that oh, we're not supposed to even talk about it. We've kind of almost like, because it's disrespectful, don't even talk it, don't even touch it. And how do you do, the in do that in an intellectually honest way, especially when you're going to be interacting with Shias and with other, you know, people who have different opinions on this? Mm -hmm. This so I mean, again, that's the difference between you know going through scholarly discussion versus lay discussion. Right. So the lay discussion is, yeah, you shouldn't even talk about the Sahaba, right? And so that's both an issue of adab of the Sahaba, right. as well as a protection for for the believers, right? Um, but in scholarly discussion, you find all over the place, right? And so you look throughout the history of of what's being said. The vast majority of Sunni scholars speak of of the killing of, of Imam Hussein as one of the worst atrocities in history. You, you would even think that, okay, if that's if that's one of the worst, then why not the killing of Ali himself, or Uthman, or Omar? And the argument that's given is that Omar's killer was this guy who was kind of just deranged, right? Uh, Uthman's killers and Ali's killers were, were this this rebellious group. Um, uh, uh, likewise for Hassan, although the, the, who killed Hassan is a big question mark. One theory is that uh, it was his wife. That's more of like the Shia reading. Uh, but in uh, the case of, of Hussein, it's the grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then on top of that, it is an established Muslim ruler. Right? And so the way, one way to take this is that, you know, like you're saying, if it can happen to them, but even on top of that, it's an inevitability. The, it's in the nature of how society works that you're going to have clash. Right? And it can be bloody clash. And one point uh, of benefit also to consider is that, all right, um, even with this civil war that takes place within just a couple of decades after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, stability still got established afterwards, which I think is a point that has to be included when we mention the, the civil war. So once someone has come to accept that, okay, you have Sahabas fighting Sahabas, then we can also emphasize that, yeah, they were still able to, despite this horrendous bloody conflict, they were still able to establish peace among themselves and stability, growing into what became super civilization. Right? But the problem of sanctifying the, pro uh, the Sahaba, uh, I think, uh, I don't know a way around it, like when do you start teaching it to people? So in Shia tradition, the Sahaba by and large are looked at as, you know, in the way Sunnis go too far in sanctifying, Shias tend to go too far in humanizing. You know, looking to pre presenting them as jealous of the house of the prophet of Ahlul Bayt and everything. But I don't know what's a good age that you start teaching this to people. Because uh, I think just in, in the style of teaching the people, you kind of want to, you know, when I was even talking about it this morning, mm -hmm. like if you saw the language that I used, saying mm -hmm. he, they were wiped out, I didn't say they were, you know, they're all slaughtered because of the young people who were present. Um, um, Shia kids in the same situation are not taught it that way. They're taught he was slaughtered brutally, 40,000 against 70. Um, uh, I think.
think everyone has to go through just that phase where you're fed something that's nice and sugary, and at some point you're shown. Reading about the Khilafat of Uthman is the hardest thing for a Muslim to do. Everything that you go through, Abu Bakr's times, everything's great. Abu Bakr's time is there. And then you're reading Abu Bakr, you're reading, like, okay, you know, you know, the people are revolting, and he's like, none of that. We're good. Yeah. And then Omar comes and he's like, you know, he's establishing the real law. Everything is like, you know, every in place. And then you have Uthman and then all of a sudden things are just start. Uh -huh. It's the longest Khilafat. It's like 23 years. Like and then, then the first half is, you can see it's starting to unravel. And by the last second half, it's completely, mm. it's, it's completely unraveled. It's the hardest so was, part of was, Islamic part of history to read. So timeline-wise, it's 30, what? So, Ali, Ali, Ali dies 661, so almost exactly 30 years after the death of the Prophet. Peace wow. Yeah. And didn't the Prophet you know, say that like this community and the peace will last about 30 years? Yeah, so it's like 29 and a half years if you include Hassan. Hassan is Khalifa for six months. Wow. And he abdicates to Islam. Yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, I think once a person can come to... 30 years is about one generation. So it seems like that that first generation of the Prophet time. I guess Ali made that comment too, right? I guess at least it's a tribute. I've heard that you know when he was so the time of Omar, the time of Omar, he had us for followers. Yeah, exactly. And the time of whereas in my time I have you for followers. So to to that point. We're so confused that the original Sahaba meant to. Well, that's right. Yeah, and. I think once a person can come to terms with all that, I think uh, um, it allows to allows them to see the world as much more real than utopian. Well, yeah, I mean, it shatters this myth of the the romanticism of the first yeah. five hundred years of, you uh -huh. know, which is kind of the rhetoric that I was spending growing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people believe it. Uh, but the more you see this whole process as a real-world process, with real people making real decisions and real mistakes, um, either it'll wipe out your Iman or it'll make it really go higher, because now you're really seeing it as something really close to just life and yeah, understanding. Yeah, could go either way. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it, <clears throat> it confirms that, that like this is real pragmatic solutions to life, uh -huh. not just high ideals yeah. that's fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we are still at it. As a community, back to our discussion about activism and utopianism, I think uh, <coughs> the utopian idealism is gone in the current college age group, but there's still a, a level of denial about you know, life and reality. That's mm -hmm. you know, to you guys in <laughs> Those two, especially, <laughs> <It's> their, <laughs> their, their <laughs> idealism is gone. It <laughs> starts right here, in 59 Baybrook, <laughs> this couch. <laughs> so it says, Will Sha Allahu, if Allah willed, Ma Maktatalu. If it was, if Allah willed, they would not have fought. Allah does what He intends. Okay, so next we're going to be talking quite a bit about giving. And we're also going to have an eye for Kursi. Okay. Then we'll stop here. I have a quick question. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to double check this. So the events with the Ashura um, across the different um, religions. So we had the Jews had the splitting of the sea. Yeah. And then there's Shia Muslims. Um, for them, it was a martyrdom. Well, it, it's it's the case for Sunnis and Shias, but okay. as something that's commemorated, uh, Sunnis are prescribed to fast in celebration. Oh, okay. And that's they they fast in celebration of this. Okay. And um, for the that was the of the. Of the uh, exodus, of the of exodus. Well, no, and the splitting of the sea, of exodus, not Shias. Sunnis, Sunnis fast oh, in, yeah. in commemoration of the splitting of of the sea. Okay, okay, yeah, that's where I was going to get to. So, the crucifixion of Jesus. So, okay, so 
So in Islam, that's Ashura. Yeah. In Judaism, that's Passover. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then but for both, it's the I mean, in Judaism, it's more of that whole liberation that's being celebrated. Okay. Yeah. And for us, it's the culmination because what's taking place, it's Allah's uh, divine involvement. They reach this point where they're at the sea and they're they're thinking, okay, we're doomed. And Allah Ta'ala gives them a way out from where they weren't expecting. And then for the Christians, it was Passover. And so, so Jesus is entering Jerusalem uh, uh, during Passover, during the whole Passover festivities. And and so his crucifixion itself takes place on the day of Passover, which is called Good Friday. Um, there was a reason why it's called good. I don't remember exactly what it because is. Because that's the day. Of, that's the sacrifice, right? In other words, that's the divine sacrifice. That's what's saving. That's what's saving yeah, humanity. Be, I remember putting it. So then, should we say that's a day of mourning? Meaning, it's uh, it is a day like 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 uh, pay attention to Good Friday when it comes by. It is a it is a day of, of sorrow. So yeah. is that why with Lent they do like some sort of? So Lent basically uh, finds its completion in Good Friday and Easter. Do they do anything on Good Friday? I used to know I remember, I should not remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what is Ash Wednesday? Is that the name That's of the Ash That's the beginning of Lent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, why do they do the Mark I used to know all these things. Yeah. 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 It's fast. Just like getting all the information. It's a Lenten. Like <laughs> just, just, just Wikipedia. <laughs> just Wikipedia. <laughs> it's a demarcation. Just Wikipedia it already. <laughs> What's interesting is that they agree on the symbolism. That's the best thing that you're taking the ashes of the earth and putting on your head. And that is verified? Like, that is in fact true. Right. They put a cross. Where is all the priest? Where is all the priest? Particular day is actually. It's an ash cross. Yeah. Meaning, this is something that I stumbled onto. Yeah. Because I was looking for, uh, it's very hard to find anything in terms of the Jews of Medina mm -hmm. and anything Jewish. Mm -hmm. But this holiday, uh, you know, the Ashura, yeah. you know, I found it whenever I was researching Passover. Wow. And then just looking at it uh, deeper, I thought, whoa, everything has a little bit. So I just stumbled onto it. it wasn't, so it's not like some big conversation. Yeah. You know? yeah. Is it the biggest morning of Ashura? Our mom has so much. Subhanallah, seriously? Yeah, it's not the day of Ashura. Subhanallah, three years ago. Well, big day. So, this, I mean, to, to give you an idea of psychologies in terms of Sunnis and Shias, Sunnis often see ourselves as like the default of Islam, right? And in the way Catholics often see themselves as the default of Christianity. And so often in the Sunni mindset, the view is, okay, why aren't Shias following the Prophet, peace be upon him? In the Shia mindset, so it's Shiat Ali, the party of Ali. Okay. In a way to think about it, that they're the defenders, they often see themselves as the defenders of the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Right? And so when Sunnis are fasting or doing anything but mourning, it looks like, uh, to many Shias, it looks like we're enjoying mm. the death of Imam wow. Hussein. Okay. Is it that extreme? Or would you say no, they, they believe that, yeah. Really? For many, yeah. So do you fast? Yeah, well I thought Ashura was tomorrow, but that was corrected. I was today? fasting today, and so I'll fast again tomorrow. Oh, no, it is tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Tuesday. Ashura is Tuesday if you follow Chicago Law. Oh. I was telling everybody at MLA it's... So tomorrow, so tomorrow and day after is what you're going to do? Yeah. yeah, so I guess I'll fast again. <laughs> yeah, these these <laughs> fasts that end at 4.45. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to fast to make up. Now is the time. Yeah. I was just telling you. Uh, yeah. got like a bunch of fasts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, and there's a fast a thon every day, so I can like have to fast. That's not until I was getting so excited. It was like, yeah. Got one out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's all good. One of two. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I can do two. Hopefully. So... Uh, I was going to say something else about Sunnis and Shias, and it will really come back to me. If, if she has not like, I don't know if this is ignorant or whatever, but if it started off as, like, a political party, when did it, like, change into a, I don't want to say sect, but... So, so party of Allah, um, don't read it as a political party. 
or part of Ali, don't read it as political part of Ali, but like, uh, if you imagine them as the defenders of Ahl al-Bayt in their minds, I think that makes a little much more sense, right? So the fundamental difference between Sunni and Shia is not over who should have been the Khalifa, that's actually even secondary. You know, we see Abu Bakr, how history played out. They say Ali, that's what should have happened. Um, it's over who, what are the sources of guidance. So Quran and the Prophet, peace on take are both. And then we go to the Sahaba, they go to the Imams. In our tradition, we are supposed to have our highest love for the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him. This is in the Quran, and this is in every one of our prayers. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. So Allah put your blessings on the Muhammad and on his family. Right? We say that every single prayer. And think about the fact that pretty much half of the Muslim world is named Hassan or Hussein. Right? It's there, but for the past 50, 80 years, we blame it on the British. For the past 50 or 80 years, it's, uh, we've kind of like removed it from, from Sunni Islam that we also uh, have at least as much love for the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him, by doctrine. Uh, but a lot of it's kind of lost. There's some places in America uh, that I hear about, like on the East Coast, that even if you mention Ali in your khutbah, people assume that you're Shia, uh, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. People think my sister, like, they always assume that she's Shia at first. Why? Or his name's Fatima? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, well, that's like such a common Fatima? name. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's very common. Oh, they call your last one, it's like Ali. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking Ali. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like, where did the changes in theology come? Like, like I know some Shia people, they don't like pray, like, certain, like, prayers. Like, they're always travelers and strange. Um, in terms of Ibadah, the Shias look like Malikis. In terms of theology and general law, they look like Hanafis. There's historical reasons behind this. Because Malikis take their ibadah from the people of Medina, so it would be the closest to the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him. In terms of law, Hanafi law comes from three Sahabas, and I always forget the third one. Oh no, it's Ali, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood, both of them were in Kufa, and then Abdullah ibn Abbas. Like, so, Maliki law, a lot of it is basically the fiqh of Omar, may be pleased with them. Hanafi law is the fiqh of those three. So Abu Hanifa was in Kufa, which is where Ali was, which is where Jafar Sadiq, who is a big scholar in Sunni tradition, but is an Imam in Shia tradition. And so a lot of mainstream Shia law resembles Hanafi law. And if you remove the title of Sunni and Shia and think of it as Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, um, Jafri, Jafri you know, Zaidi, then I think it's easier to make sense of it all. So where is like the big theological Because like, you know, like the other world, Yeah, I, I don't think that's as much mainstream. Oh, that's not. So, like, you're, you're saying mainstream. the majority of Shia pray back then? Right? It's, yeah, I'm saying majority of Shia, it's hard to tell the difference between a Shia and a Sunni, except in sentiment. Like, a, a Sunni usually doesn't have the consciousness of a Shia. A Shia has a consciousness of Sunnis in their outlook. Like, they have a consciousness that we're not Sunni. A Sunni doesn't usually have the consciousness that we're not Shia. And it goes with being a minority, right? So, you're a minority Muslim in the society, you have a consciousness about not being Christian or not being white. Right, something like that, and so Shias have a, the minority consciousness that goes with that—that that we are not the majority. Is that a negative consciousness? Sometimes. Yeah. So, or at least a defensive theory. one, right? I mean, you can call it negative defensive, but I don't think it's all that different in terms of how we look at ourselves as like Muslims in America, right? I think there's a lot of stuff we can automatically understand. Yes. Saying, um, if you, as a Sunni, if you're praying behind someone who's Shia, as a Sunni, is it accepted? Because vice versa, it's not. Um, I mean, I know a lot of Shias who are hardcore Shias who play who pray behind Sunnis, but I think it depends on who you ask. Is that? I mean, is it, I've, I haven't. I mean, I've seen Shias pray more often behind Sunnis than vice versa. To tell you the truth, yeah. yeah. again, they have a consciousness. Mm -hmm. of, like when Doctor Sfar went to Iran, he prayed behind Shia imams, and a whole bunch of people gave him a lot of grief when he came back, and then he gave his whole argument, but never really read why. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And questions so or thoughts? Was, mm -hmm. a, like, scholar I'm saying that uh, their methods are very similar because even their formation is very similar. Yeah. Zaydis tend to be a little bit different. But, I mean, the big one are Afna, Shari, Imani, Jafri, right? That's what you have all over Iran. Yeah. This might seem like a bad question, but no one's Shia here, so. 
Um, so do a lot of them. Is it on? Is okay, it on? so like that, that whole yeah, hitting so. themselves thing, is that just like a very small minority of them? Well, so someone asked me about this in class. At, at the, someone uh, asked me about this in class, and I said, yeah, this is what some Shias do. And then a Lebanese Shia raised her hand saying, we don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you find it uh, in that stretch across Central Asia into the subcontinent, not as much in the Arab world, stretching the other way. Like, so you find it in Iran, you find it in Afghanistan, you find it in subcontinent. Um, but it seems as though, in, it seems that in the Arab world, it's more just a period of intense mourning. Any questions? And, and she and friends of mine have said that, that it's actually like a really meaningful, almost like a cathartic ritual. And if you, if you put it all together, that you're being groomed to be to feel grief over this day, over something you haven't done, right? This is also, this is kind of like the, you know, the Muslim critique of Christianity. Mm -hmm. In Catholicism, you have grief over original sin, grief over the crucifixion of Jesus, but you didn't, you didn't do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. But then this self-flagellation also becomes a cathartic experience uh, to release that, that grief. How mainstream is that? I mean, I don't really know, but it's one of those things that everyone notices it. So it might be a tiny minority, yeah, but it just seems so so widespread just because it's so. And even like the American, American Shia community, like I think, or, you know, um, uh, Aris and you know Hina, they're they're involved. In, they they do it in you know these, these ritualistic you know, the type ceremonies. So, I mean, I think. I mean, there, but I guess I always caution that, you know, there are a lot of things that qualify as Sunni if you go to the subcontinent. Yeah. There are a lot of, just because, you know, just because it doesn't fit in, just because it's Sunni, you'll see a lot of things that you would look at and say, this has nothing to do with yeah. the pra practice of the Prophets of Allah. Yeah. So the, um, and nobody turns around and tells those Shias, oh, well, you're, oh, you might be doing something deviant, but you're not deviant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, they will turn to Shia, turn to Shia practices, and mm. try and say they're deviants. Not that the pra not that the practice is straight away, but they are deviants for what they do. The uh, yeah. So Dr. Star had a huge like 180 degree turn on this, like to really make the point that Ashura is supposed to be a day of celebration. So he's doing this in Pakistan, right, where everything shuts down for, for Ashura. All of his girls' weddings he had on Ashura, right, to really really make this point. And it ruffled out. Which make what point? That, that for Sunnis, this is a day of celebration. Mm -hmm. right? It's well and good if she has a morning, but for us, it doesn't mean we stop our religious practices and enjoyment and all those things. Right? And his views changed over the years, um, where he basically said something similar to this that uh, <clears throat> there are people in, that are in the umbrella of, Shia, of Sunni that do things that are way, way off, off the radar uh, that are accepted as, as Sunni. So ultimately, anyone who accepts the Shahada, who accepts the, uh, the inerrancy of the Qur'an, um, Day of Judgment, you can't call them a kafir. Right? And groups like Sipai Sahaba, what's Sipai Sahaba? Sipai Sahaba. The soldiers of the Prophet, literally translated. Or of the companions. Soldiers of the companions, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is a militant anti-Shia group. You know, they took really huge, uh, what's the word, umbrage, like they really, really despised like Dr. Sars' change. To the point that Sipa Sahabi people in Chicago would question all doctors for our students, you know, these are the monophic. How can you love the monophic? And this and that. I forget, uh, one of my first women was at downtown Thompson, or somebody came up to me and said, You know, you're a very good speaker, right? <laughs> you know, I want you to listen to this. I, mean, I don't even know what language he spoke, but uh, he, said, Give me. <laughs> he, he gives me this Urdu tape. Every pop is a basic pop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, he was definitely basic, but I don't know if he was talking Urdu or. or English, and he gave me this tape that it, or the title was Shia Kafir Kyum. Like, oh, Jeez, wow. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, yeah. No subtlety there, man. Wow. I don't know, this guy was giving a khutbah AIC and he was saying that, I mean, I think as soon as in America we should keep both things in mind, you know. That it is a celebration, but also, you know, something t truly horrific happened that day. Yeah. And I don't think that's mm. wrong. I mean, again, across Sunni, tra Sunni traditions, it's looked at as a horrific day, but not connected to an act of worship. 
That's that's basically a fundamental difference. Right. I guess that is maybe that's where the dissociation needs to happen. That, in other words, in other words, what Doctor Israel Ahmed was saying yeah. initially, his initial position, yeah. where it was becoming an idea of celebrate. You know, there's a act of worship, which is just in a matter of obedience. The yeah. Prophet of Allah told us to do it, therefore we do it. Yeah. But to turn that into an act of celebr you know, an act of celebration, no, it's a it's mm -hmm. it's a day of worship. Mm -hmm. And that you know, I think we're you know, if we're going to let me say, you know, if we first of all, if we're going to acknowledge something that was truly a tragedy to us, yeah. we cannot say you know, in other words, it's like it's like a tragic event happening on a good day. Huh? You, you exactly. know, if, so if if you know somebody's somebody's parent parent passes away yeah. on a day that they were born uh -huh. on their birthday, their birthday will never be the same yeah. again to them. Sure. And Absolutely. so, mm. so the mother dies on Ashura. Mm. You mentioned something in that conversation about how okay, so the Sunnis as a collectively would um, sort of hold up the Ahlul Bayt and the family of the Prophet. Yeah. Um, but then you said colonialism changed that. Or I explained you... everything that that seems to be missing on the British. That, so I'm just saying that. You know. Oh, that was just a sarcastic. Comment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but, I thought you. Meant... But in our tradition, um, uh, in Sunni tradition, uh, your love for the family of the Prophet peace upon him is a pathway to love for the Prophet peace upon him because you're loving what he loves, and that in itself, the love of the Prophet peace upon him is a pathway to love for Allah. Right. Uh, the difference, however, is who the Shias consider to be Ahl al-Bayt and yeah. who the Sunnis do. For the Shias is Khadija, then Fatima, Ali, and then their descendants. Whereas for Sunnis, it's all the wives, Aisha, Umm Salama, everybody. Oh, really? Yeah. So they don't... Because the other wives didn't have children. Was it? With him, no. With him, no. Yeah. Okay. Would they be officially considered Ahl al-Bayt? That's a good question, because then would Uthman be considered to be Ahl al-Bayt? Uh, I don't know. Because then Abu Bakr and, and Omar are fathers of Ma. Mm -hmm. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Uh, I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to see. So in terms of law, there are sources of law. In terms of love, there are objects of love. So law and love are two different things. Any other questions or thoughts? It takes me about six months to adjust to the time change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We got another hour of sleep, right? Yeah. It's already gone. Really, it's already gone. That's never really it's good, good an issue for me. It's just like, if I want another hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>